Well, welcome to session number 10, topic 17, coax cable. Uh, coax cable is only about 51 slides this evening, and since the topic of HF antennas um, that we did on Tuesday was so intense and so lengthy, I think uh, I just want to do this topic only this evening and wrap up the entire um, uh, the entire course on Monday with RF and electrical safety. I think it's enough to chew on right now for the uh, HF antennas and the coax cable uh, topics. That, that's enough to absorb. If you study these two, you want to go back and look at the uh, previous session for HF antennas and this one that we're doing this evening. Um, it'll give you a little bit better understanding of how of the antenna situation and coaxial cable is concerned. Excuse me. <clears throat> I was trying to get my voice here. If you look in your book on page 189, you'll see some pictures there of um, different types of coaxial cable construction. And uh, while coax is not the only type of uh, feed line that you're going to use to your antenna from your uh, rig, um, this is what we're going to predominantly cover this evening. Again, in this course, this enables you to get the information necessary to pass your exam uh, and upgrade from technician to general class license. And as I've said before, your real learning is going to begin when you get your license because nothing is better than hands-on experience. And especially if you can get hands-on experience uh, from another ham or even a group of hams, uh, an Elmer that... Um, can uh, help you and assist you with all this, and uh, you'll gain a much, much better understanding. Well, without any further ado, I want to get started here, <clears throat> and it's such a nice day. Uh, that's the other reason I kind of want to just do this particular topic. It'll take us about an hour to do this, and then uh, uh, we'll finish up with this topic this evening, and I can get outside and do some more stuff. So here we go. Well, as we said before, uh, coaxial cable is usually rated at 50 ohms, especially for am amateur radio applications. And 50 ohms is not a resistive load. Uh, if you put your meter across it end to end, uh, if you're uh, doing a continuity test, it's going to read as pretty much as a dead short electrically. But uh, RF-wise, uh, there's an impedance of about 50 ohms along the length of the coax. <clears throat> uh, we also mentioned that a TV coax is rated at 70, uh, 75 ohms. And uh, there's other factors that go into your coaxial cable, your feed line, and that's velocity factor is another one. Um, loss in a feed line is important. And the higher in frequency you go, the more loss you're going to encounter on your feed line. So you want to make sure that you don't have uh, very much loss and you use the appropriate type of coaxial cable or feed line that minimizes the loss for the band that you're going to be using. Um, as we mentioned here, 75 ohm antenna feed line is used for special antennas in certain applications for, ra for the radio amateur. And as I said before, here you have uh, an illustration of the inside construction of a coaxial cable. It typically uh, consists of a center conductor along with some type of dielectric, dielectric, in this case, they're saying polyethylene. Uh, and uh, you typically want a copper braid, although there are aluminum braids out there. And then, and then you have the jacket that's on the outside.
As I mentioned, the higher you go in frequency, the greater the attenuation of the transmission line. And this is why it's very important to always use the largest size coaxial cable available for VHF and UHF frequency. Uh, what they're talking about here, the attenuation is the amount of loss that you're going to get uh, when that signal travels down uh, that whatever length of cable you're using <clears throat> on your feed line to the antenna. Like I say, at VHF and UHF, it's very lossy. And uh, the better grade cable you use for those frequencies, the less loss you're going to have. This is a typical chart here that uh, uh, shows the approximate loss of signal per 100 feet. And they're usually expressed in decibels. And uh, remember, we talked about decibels and what the uh, decibel references. A 3 dB loss is going to be about half the power going down. So if you're, if you're feeding a 2-meter signal down the feed line to the antenna, and let's say just for the sake of simplicity that the feed line is 100 feet, and you encounter... Uh, a 3 dB loss along the length of that uh, coax, you're cutting basically your signal in half. If you send 100 watts down, it's only 50 watts is only going to arrive. If you send 50 watts, about 25 watts is going to arrive at the antenna. Of course, that can also be made up uh, given a particular gain aspect or characteristic of the antenna that you're feeding. So if you feed um, 25, if you feed 50 watts down the line, and this is a very simplistic explanation. This is not hard and fast. This is just a very simplistic uh, explanation just to kind of give you a little bit better understanding uh, on loss and gain and things of that sort. Uh, but if you feed 50, uh, 50 watts into your coaxial cable uh, on two meters, and it has a 3 dB loss, and you get to the antenna, and basically you're feeding the antenna around 25 watts of power at that point. But let's say the antenna has 6 dB gain, and that's going to be four times uh, the power, basically. So you're really going to get a an effective radiated power, or an ERP, of approximately 100 watts on the antenna. Now, if you were able to get the almost the entire 50 watts out to the antenna and it has a 6 dB gain, well, 4 times 50 is about 200 watts. So there you go. Uh, just a little explanation. But study that chart there. And um, this is for RG8 coaxial cable with a foam dielectric. The characteristics of cable concerning loss is um, is going to be uh, it's, it's, the characteristic of a cable is going to determine the actual loss that you might experience on a particular feed line. There's different dielectrics. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I was eating chocolate before this. That's <laughs> just coming up in my throat. At any rate, uh, sorry about that. At any rate, this is for RG8 coax. Now there's RG58. There's there's other there's all types of coax out there. There's there's coaxial cable. There's hard line. There's all kinds of uh, different selections out there with different characteristics to uh, minimize loss. But you'll learn that as we go along. But we're trying to simplify things here as it regards to the uh, course. On the examination, it will be expected that certain things are committed to memory. So in the world, real world of ham radio, there are charts available for this information. So like I said, your real education is going to start once you get licensed. And there's all kinds of material out there available to help you um, with gaining more knowledge and understanding of how things work, the principles of transmission and electric and things of that sort. At any rate, in this question, they're going to ask the percentage of loss from a trans 
transmission line of 1 dB. So 1 dB of loss results in about 0.795 or 79.5% of the energy making it through the coax, leading to 20.5% getting lost in the transmission line. So 100% minus 79.5% is 20.5% loss. So we just need to be careful about that. Good evening, Cohen. Good evening. How are you? Oh, I'm not too bad. Sorry I missed the last classes. That's all right. I mean, it's all there on YouTube for uh, for posterity, and uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to look at them if you haven't already. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, tonight I'm only going to cover coaxial cable. Um, it's not a very long uh, session, so I'll probably wrap it up pretty early, like within the next 45 minutes or so. Okay. And uh, we'll be able to enjoy the outside a little bit more. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> All right, I'm going to continue on here. And I was just kind of explaining uh, a little bit about. Um, I can't mute you. Can you mute? I can do that. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I don't know. One I don't know why I lost control on this end. At any rate, I was just explaining the different types of coax and the different characteristics of the coaxial cable um, that determine the amount of loss, velocity factor, and um, things of that sort as it relates. I figure that having done the antenna thing the other day uh, on Tuesday was rather lengthy. Um, I did manage to get it in within two hours, but um, it's a lot of information to kind of uh, kind of take in. But the coax cable and the HF antennas kind of go together, so I didn't want to really muck up this, this evening session with the RF and electrical safety, and I'm going to finish that up on Monday. But at any rate, uh, we're talking about the loss of the cable, and uh, let me move right along here. All right. Hams who operate HF equipment into an external or manual antenna tuner may reduce SWR losses to a non-resident antenna, resonant, not resident, resonant antenna, by using the manual tuner's parallel conductor output setting. Parallel feed lines like the old TV twin lead are rated at 300 ohms. Uh, some types of uh, parallel conductor are about 600 ohms. Um, ladder line, you can construct ladder line fairly easy. And um, that, uh, that also is about that. But you can minimize SWR losses and allow a manual tuner to tune most any type of wire antenna, such as loops, quads, delta loops, rhombics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The flat two conductor feed line must be kept away from anything else metal, or it may arc over. So being too close to anything metal could also create an electrical imbalance of voltage and currents in the feed line. The G5RV is an excellent example of an antenna that uses a twin lead type or parallel feed type uh, feed line. And, uh, but that's only for portion, uh, portion of it. And that's so you can still feed that. You usually have a ballon that runs uh, from your shack to uh, out to the uh, feed line of the G5RV, but uh, it helps to uh, tune and use even part of that twin lead or the, the parallel leads as part of the antenna uh, and radiator for the different bands that uh, you're tuning. And the only thing that really is concerning about your radio, again, is that it's looking for a nice little low SWR and about a 50 ohm impedance. It doesn't mean your signal is going to be inefficient uh, in, in totality just because of the way the G5RV is designed. As I uh, stated before, there are certain characteristics of impedance of a transmission line that you really can't measure directly. Uh, but at any rate, uh, if you look at this little... Um, little Elmer point here. Uh, it has a good article 
from 1956 in QST. You can find those usually archived online. And uh, But there's a lot of things to kind of take into consideration when it comes to feed line and the amount of loss and velocity factor and stuff. Velocity factor actually refers to um, how fast that signal is going to travel down the feed line as compared to how fast the uh, signal travels in free space. So you'll see you'll see velocity factors like 60 or maybe 70, you know, something like that. Here we have a picture of a parallel two-wire line. Uh, this one is more like a uh, ladder line right here. There's your typical twin lead. Uh, there's twisted pair. That's not really used too often. Some of the old timers really like to build their own ladder line. And I don't see too many people using uh, this flat ribbon twin lead. Um, but there is one that's kind of an open parallel line. And uh, I have some here. Uh, it's a little bit spaced a little bit further uh, wider apart, the twin leads, than normal TV twin lead is. Uh, just a little bit of. Uh, information here on the air coaxial with uh, washer insulator your center conductor runs all the way down the middle and it's kept in the middle by these little washers inside there but your dielectric is all air in there here you have a polyethylene dielectric it comes in foam and different other uh, types of dielectrics but again the construction is the inner conductor. That's your main signal going down the feed line, your dielectric, your shield, and then your jacket. Characteristic impedance of parallel conductor antenna feed line is most influenced by the distance between the center of the conductors and slightly influenced by actual radius of the conductors. Kind of keep that in mind. There's a the the impedance can vary depending on how far apart those parallel connectors are um, going on a twin lead and also affected by the actual radiate uh, radius or the gauge of the wire uh, conductors in there so an impedance bump is caused when the parallel conductor feed line twists and kinks in the wind dramatically changing the distance between the conductors so until the feed line gets straightened out, the impedance will no longer be constant. And if you're running parallel conductor feed line, keep it absolutely unkinked, if at all possible, and keep it away from metal mass. And if the parallel conductor uh, is part of the vertical radiator, make sure it hangs straight down and never coiled up on itself. Again, uh, that pretty much references the G5RV as well. So you always want to try to match your feed point impedance. If the antenna to the characteristic impedance of the feed line for maximum power transfer and uh, minimum SWR. Uh, if you have the best match possible, you'll get maximum power transfer and minimum standing wave ratio or reflected losses back to the transmitter. A directional watt meter makes a dandy standing wave ratio checker. So maximum forward power with minimum reflected power will indicate an acceptable, acceptably low SWR. Um, back in the CB days, I used this the little uh, single meter that uh, came that I bought at the little CB shop, and uh, you did a little. Uh, tuning or calibration, and then you could read the SWR. These days, I use what's called a twin needle um, meter, and um, let's see if I can find that. Stand by just for a second. 
Yeah. What's going on here? Okay. Got that. Ah, what did I do? Well, let's see. Let me bring this back up again. There's that. Trying to, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, well, I'll tell you, it's probably best. Let's see if I can pick this up over here. Uh, well, I don't want to disconnect my, my meter here. Uh, let's see. I'll type it in. 949. The tuner, get a little image up here, and um, kind of pull this over a little bit. If you look at this picture here, um, this is a, a double needle um, meter, and what this does is on one side it shows going up the power out and on this this needle here will show how much power is reflected and uh, so wherever it pretty much crosses uh, the red line it'll tell you what the equivalent swr is and uh, it aids in tuning your um, your antenna and all or tuning Tuning the impedance, impedance, let's put it that way, that makes your transmitter happy. So dual needle uh, meters are actually a preferred way to check things these days. Uh, pull that back over here and we'll get going again. You want to keep the impedances of your feed line and antenna the same for minimum standing wave ratio. Standing waves are set up on the feed line because power is being reflected back due to an impedance mismatch. It's one of the reasons why uh, balins were created. Uh, they help to take your feed line, whatever feed line and impedance, whatever feed line you're using and the impedance of that feed line and match it to your antenna impedance at the feed point. And it's not that you can't run coaxial cable straight to the antenna. You certainly can. Uh, if you want maximum performance, uh, sometimes a bail-in is the best way to go to give you the proper matching. Uh, if you remember the uh, session on transformers, you have step up and step down as far as impedance is concerned. Uh, 50 into 50 is a perfect match. So your SWR would be one to one, although nobody ever really gets one to one that I know of. It's usually one point something to one. But here is a choke or a balin made out of good quality coax, and it's an effective means of preventing your transmission line from radiating and causing other unpredictable behavior. This is more of a choke than anything, I think. Um, but uh, it's sometimes called the ugly balin. But if it's assembled neatly like this one, it doesn't have to be ugly at all. And uh, it'll help uh, keep those standing waves from reflecting back and give you a little bit better impedance match on your antenna. In a transmission line that has measurable, measurable losses, the loss will increase as the SWR increases. And what that means is the more reflected power back towards the transmitter, the, it's more standing wave uh, coming back as compared to the ratio. If, if, you, have, if you have a two to one, um, you're doing twice the... I mean, you're really doing about the same reflected back as going out. And right about two to one is where most 
of your transmitters, if they have a safety circuit in them, will probably start decreasing power. So your 100 watt transmitter, as it uh, looks out onto that coaxial or that feed line, and the more loss it sees or the more reflected uh, power it uh, encounters, the lower the power output is going to uh, go out on the uh, on the transmitter as it is, and sometimes just completely shut down. So just remember that the loss will increase as your SWR increases. Where's that? Oh, there it is. My glass is sweating all over my desk. Uh, any rate. Okay. Um, this is a rather lengthy description here. <laughs> I'm talking about information being a dangerous thing. Uh, a very low SWR can mean you have a very good antenna or a very effective dummy load, <laughs> basically. Um, the reflected power uh, will always be attenuated um, if you have uh, an impedance mismatch. Let's put it that way. So what we really want to be concerned with here is SWR will always be lower at the input end of a lossy transmission line. If you can measure out along the length of it, you'll see about where all of that actually starts to occur and there's an exponential uh, occurrence of reflected uh, signal coming back. But all in all, what really happens is that as the uh, loss increases, the higher your SWR is going to be. And at UHF frequencies, the losses can be really, really great if you're using a really low grade coax uh, that even with no antenna connected, the SWR will read one to one or nearly so. And all this is telling you is that the transmission line is absorbing all the power. So there's a need to understand what we're really measuring and the SWR meter is a handy tool, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And so you really need to use that with a little bit of caution. That's why it's good to have a nice antenna analyzer or know somebody that's got one that can actually uh, has the capability to look out on the coaxial line out towards the antenna and give you a little bit more pertinent information, like whether there's an open circuit or whether there's a certain amount of uh, capacitive reactants or inductive reactants or any type of other type of impedance that uh, could be causing loss on your line. But at any rate, um, just kind of remember this, that the SWR will always be lower at the end of a lossy transmission line. There's a lot more to this than just putting an SWR meter on there. You can build a 10 or 15 meter ground plane antenna just out of copper tubing. And just remember the radiating element is about one quarter wavelength long. And the ground radials are also about one quarter wavelength long. So you really have a half wave antenna right there. But the ground radials really need to be bent down at an approximate uh, 45 degree angle in order to bring the impedance up to 50 ohms because the impedance is going to be really, really low. So if the ground plane copper tubes extend straight out at 90 degrees from the base of the ground plane, the impedance might look like 25 ohms instead of 50. And of course, this would result in an SWR reading of about 2 to 1. It's acceptable, but easily improved simply by bending the ground radials down at 45 degrees. And they're talking specifically here for about 10 or 15 meters for HF. If you build yourself a just a, a little half wave or a quarter wave antenna for two meters, which is really simply built by a chassis mount SO239 uh, turned upside down, uh, you can put uh, four little radials on it 
and you don't have to bend them down to 45 de uh, degrees on two meters. Just only slightly do they have to be uh, bent down, maybe about five to 10 degrees, and that's acceptable for uh, a frequency in two meters. Okay, um, maximum power transfer. Uh, a bunch of formulas here that uh, we're looking at, and you see this little chart. Um, the output transformer has an output impedance of about 10 ohms. So they've plotted the power delivered to the uh, inductive uh, re reactants uh, as reductive or inductive reactance varies when voltage is equal to 10 volts. Just kind of study this little um, little chart here. There is a little bit better explanation in the book, uh, I do believe, on this. Where is it? Well, if I can find it here, there it is on page 194. So um, it just gives you the uh, basics of how they're kind of calculating this uh, as far as getting maximum trans power transfer out. Of course, I'd put a pretzel in my mouth right when I shifted uh, slides here. <laughs> I guess I'm hungry. So a perfect quarter wave ground plane antenna with a quarter wave vertical section and an infinite number of quarter wave horizontal radials will have an impedance of 36 ohms, exactly half that of a dipole in free space, which is about 72 ohms. While this antenna will work with no modification, you can achieve a better match to 50 ohms by slanting the radials downward. If you're building one, it's probably not gonna have an infinite number of radials. You might have three or four. Okay. In this particular question, they're telling you that 50 goes into 200 four times, so the impedance of the mismatch is 4 to 1. 1 to 4 is not the correct answer, even though it does look correct. When you're referencing SWR, the higher number is always on the left. So whichever value is larger is the numerator, which means the SWR by definition will always be equal to or greater than one to one. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't know anybody that can actually achieve one to one. Usually it's about 1.1 to one, 1.2 to one, and that's fine. And if, if your antenna is cut for a specific frequency, you will notice that from that center frequency, that's what we refer to the center frequency at resonant at resonance. If you tune on the upper side of that center frequency or the lower side of that center frequency, you will also notice that the SWR begins to go up um, on either side of that. And that's because it's not at the perfect frequency. And that's okay. Um, most of your antennas uh, you, and rigs you can run you know, comfortably at 1.5 to 1, uh, and even sometimes up to about 2 to 1. And you won't suffer uh, too much issues or problems with your transmitter, even at 2 to 1. But in most cases, uh, the, the bandwidth of the general class bands are such that whatever antenna you use, if you center it on the band on either side, you're probably never going to exceed 1.5 or even 1.6 at the extreme ends uh, of the band that you're operating. 
So by definition, a perfect match is an SWR of one to one, which is the lowest value uh, value possible. So to calculate SWR, always divide the larger impedance by the smaller one. So 10 goes into 55 times. So the mismatch is five to one. One to five is not correct. Your larger number is always gonna be on the left. That's your denom uh, um, numerator. A folded dipole, these are very interesting antennas. They have a characteristic impedance of about 300 ohms, and that's why it is often fed with twin lead and the impedance transformed with the use of a manual antenna tuner. So if you tried to hook up a 50 ohm coax cable directly to a 300 ohm feed point, your SWR would be an unacceptable six to one. And if you divide 50 ohms into 300 ohms to calculate the six to one ratio. Wow, there's a lot of stuff here to read. SWR is determined only by the load impedance. The SWR will still be five to one. Um, Yeah, <laughs> the antenna tuner or coupler will only change the input impedance or the impedance your transmitter sees. It doesn't actually tune an antenna. That's kind of a misnomer. If you have a base-loaded antenna with variable tap on it, then you're kind of tuning the antenna there. But um, showing how the system works as a whole and still deliver full power to the load, assume the transmission line is not too lossy itself and the antenna tuner is of high quality. So using some of these standard charts, you can see a six to one SWR results in about a 51% power being reflected from the load. So for simplicity, we'll round it to 50. And this means no further action is taken with a 100 watt transmitter, 50 watts will be delivered to the load. We'll assume the transmitter has no protective circuitry to back off the power. Um, if it does, it's not going to deliver 100 watts out. It's going to cut and continue to cut back the higher SWR it sees. But let's put a good antenna tuner in line near the transmitter and adjust the tuner until the transmitter sees 50 ohms. The transmitter is once again delivering 100 watts into the antenna tuner. And if we were to take, to take a good directional watt meter and put it on the output side of the tuner, we would see about 100 watts reflected from the load. And this may seem odd since we know we're only reflecting 50% of the power from the mismatched load. But you got to remember SWR is determined only by the load. So where is that missing 100 watts going? Is it somehow lost in the tuner? Well, not exactly. Uh, if you switch your trusty bird watt meter, if you have one of those to the forward direction, uh, we see 200 watts forward power. Well, the, you know, the numbers then add up, but what's happening? What we're seeing is a double conjugate match on the output which causes the reflected power to be reflected and added to the power passing through the tuner. So what it's really doing is it's cycling through the antenna tuner. Your transmitter is happy and it's cycling through there and it's going back, you know, out to the uh, antenna. The, you still have to remember that any type, anytime this happens, you really shouldn't be operating with a six to one SWR uh, or you have a lot of loss. And it doesn't mean your antenna is operating efficiently at all. Uh, but the greater you can match all the components at the impedance of the feed point of the antenna to the impedance of the feed line, you're, get, you're going to get maximum power out on the antenna and down the transmission line. There is, like I said before, there's a lot of factors that go into selecting your feed line, selecting your balance, 
and knowing how your uh, antenna is going to operate, the proximity to uh, objects, uh, how close it is to ground, uh, the type of dielectric that's being used. For the most part, if you want to get that deep into it, um, I really wouldn't be too concerned with it at this point. Uh, just know that the SWR is determined only by the load impedance. A licensed tech class operator, um, you may have encountered the type N connector. So when working with UHF and microwave equipment, the type N connector is uh, great to use for VHF and UHF. It provides a lot less loss. Of course, we're all more familiar with the PL259, uh, which is still acceptable. Uh, when you get into microwave, though, you're going to be getting into problems where uh, the PL259 is not going to work very well. And the PL259 is fairly acceptable for VHF, for most, most VHF and UHF work. But if you really want a good connection, the N-type connector is the way to go. And um, it is also moisture res resistant and it works very well all the way up to 10 gigahertz if you plan on operating that high in frequency. So when working, working with high frequency transceivers, it's doubtful that you'll need a type N connector for HF work. The modern handheld has switched from an antenna connector called the BNC. Those were quite popular back in the day when I got started. The BNC was just a little shoved down, twist on, twist off, pull off type connector. It was pretty easy. But now we have a little threaded antenna connector called an SMA. And even the microwave operators up to 10, 000, uh, 10 gigahertz will use SMA connectors because they are very good for several gigahertz. The most common antenna connector for HF radios operating up to 150 megahertz uh, or the two meter band is the PL259. I mentioned that earlier. The FCC works uh, very closely with the FAA when it comes to towers taller than 200 feet. So although actually in most cases, you don't need FCC approval for towers less than 200 feet, you may still need approval from your city or homeowners association. Uh, that's why a lot of hams don't move into neighborhoods where HOAs exist, because chances are you're not going to be able to put one up. And if you live in an area that is close to an airport within a certain proximity, if you plan on putting up a 200 foot, 300, 400 foot tower, you're going to get, you're going to need FAA approval um, and FCC approval to put that tower up. Just, and you may have to uh, also comply with certain lighting requirements to uh, make sure that your tower is visible at, especially at night to aircraft if you're in close proximity to an, an airport, even a little private airport nearby. All right, well, that kind of wraps it up. We're going to get into the question uh, session here. Um, the typical characteristic, did I do that right? Yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, what are the typical characteristic impedances of coaxial cables used for antenna feed lines at amateur stations? Uh, be careful with this one. Uh, there's, there's a double choice for each selection there, but I think we pretty much covered it, and you pretty much know that 50 and 75 ohms are, are, can be used by uh, ham radio stations. You can certainly use a 75 ohm um, feed line if that's what's available and you don't want to lay out the expense for 50 ohm. So how does the attenuation of coaxial cable change as the frequency of the signal 
uh, it is carrying increases. Remember the attenuation, as the frequency increases, so does the attenuation or the loss of your signal increase along that feed line. And in what units are RF feed line losses usually expressed? Uh, be very careful. There's there's a couple here that, uh, I mean, this can confuse some people, but really we're only, most charts will show it as 100 feet and decibels uh, of loss per 100 feet. What percentage of power loss would result from a transmission line loss of 1 dB? Uh, very, um, kind of not really significant, but it does represent about 20.5% of your power if you have a 1 dB loss. So what is the characteristic impedance of flat ribbon TV type twin lead? We're talking about twin lead here. We're not talking about coaxial cable. And it's a very simple answer. It's 300 ohms. Which of the following factors determine the characteristic impedance of a parallel conductor antenna feed line? So there are certain factors in this parallel conductor that could, in, uh, in fact, affect the impedance of the feed line. We're not just talking about twin lead here. We're talking about ladder line and, and other open uh, twin lead type uh, feed lines. But predominantly, the distance between the centers of the conductors and the radius of the conductors is the correct answer. So what must be done to prevent standing waves on an antenna feed line? And as you look at these different options, um, the best option to look at here is D at the bottom. The antenna feed point impedance must be matched to the characteristic impedance of the feed line. That's why balins were invented. Which of the following can be determined with a directional watt meter? Again, we're looking at that SWR with a directional watt meter. It uh, <clears throat> will tell you whether you have standing wave ratio um, and what, what the value of that standing wave or SWR happens to be. What might cause reflected power at the point where a feed line connects to an antenna? Okay, what might cause the reflected power? And remember, we were talking about the impedance uh, of the antenna feed point matching the impedance of the feed line. So there's a difference between feed line impedance and antenna feed point impedance. That's what might cause reflected power. So what standing wave ratio will result from the connection of a 50 ohm feed line to a non-reactive load having a 50 ohm impedance? Okay, the standing wave or the SWR uh, that will occur if you have a 50 ohm feed line and uh, a load of 50 ohm impedance. Ideally, it's gonna be one to one in any ideal situation. What is the interaction between a high standing wave ratio and transmission line loss? The, the interaction. Um, a is incorrect. There's always an interaction there. Um, and high SWR does not make it difficult to measure transmission line loss and high w SWR uh, does not reduce the relative effect of transmission. B is your correct answer here. If the transmission line is lossy, uh, high SWR will increase that loss uh, most definitely. So the better quality transmission line you can afford or utilize to feed your antenna, uh, the better off you're going to be and also matching it to the feed line 
or feed the the feed point of the antenna. What is the effect of transmission line loss on SWR measured at the input to the line? Okay. Um, th this is this is really just kind of a, a tricky thing that you're just going to have to memorize because in reality, the higher the transmission line loss, the more the SWR will read artificially low um, at the input to the line. That's at the input to the line. Remember that. Oh, I can't read this one very well. Let's slide. <laughs> I am, let's see, which question was that? Let me back up here. G9A15. Give me just a moment. Uh, so this one would be... G9A12 is what I believe that is. What standing wave ratio will result when connecting a 50 ohm feed line to a non reactive load having 25 ohm impedance? The standing wave ratio when you're connecting a 50 ohm feed line to a non reactive load having about a 25 ohm impedance that's going to be about a two to one very simple answer if you just understand that uh, it's the difference between 25 and 50 ohms it's a two to one swr so which of the following is a common way to adjust the feed point impedance of a quarter wave ground plane vertical antenna to be approximately 50 ohms. So you really want to slope those radials downward and uh, it'll uh, help match the feed line impedance. What standing wave ratio will result when connecting a 50 ohm feed line to a non reactive load having 200 ohm input, uh, 200 ohm impedance? Um, remember what that number, how this is actually configured, because 200 ohms divided by 50 is going to be a 4 to 1, not 1 to 4. It's always 4 to 1. What standing wave ratio will result connecting a 50 ohm feed line to a non-reactive load having 10 ohms impedance? Again, um, it, no matter what you do, or how this is done, the little number is going into the bigger number, but you're really going to come into a five to one standing wave ratio. What standing wave ratio will result when connecting a 50 ohm feed line to an antenna that has a purely resistive 300 ohm feed point impedance? Purely resistive. Okay, now that's a little bit different, but still, you're going to divide 50 ohms into 300, and you're going to come out with 6 to 1. If the SWR on an antenna feed line is 5 to 1, and a matching network at the transmitter end of the feed line is adjusted to 1 to 1 SWR, what is the resulting SWR on the feed line? Just try to think about this for a little bit. The SWR on the antenna feed line is 5 to 1. What is the resulting SWR on the feed line? Your answer is right there. 5 to 1. <laughs> I'm not, honestly, I don't know why this question's in there. Because they gave you the answer right in the question. <laughs> Which of the following describes a type N connector? So a type N connector is uh, better for higher frequencies, of course. So it is also moisture resistant and it's useful to 10 gigahertz. What is a type SMA connector? 
And remember, that's a little tiny connector now that uh, is used in many applications, especially on your portable radios. But it's just a really small threaded connector suitable for signals up to several gigahertz. And if you remember that the SMA can handle up to several gigahertz, then you know what the answer is going to be because it's the only answer selection that has the reference to gigahertz. Which of these connector types is commonly used for RF service at frequencies up to 150 megahertz? Like we stated before, the PL259 is a very common connector that uh, easily connects up on, onto the end of your coaxial cable and you hook it up to your uh, VHF two meter transmitter transceiver. All right, last question. What is the maximum height above ground to which an antenna st structure may be erected without requiring notification to the FAA and registration with the FCC, provided it is not at or near a public use airport? Okay, remember that. It has to be away from an airport. Even at, if it's near there, you, you may have to get permission and comply with lighting requirements. But the maximum height not near a public use, uh, use airport is 200 feet without permission from the FAA or the FCC. And that right there ends the show for the night. Um, it's just a little bit after eight here. And we're going to wrap it up Monday evening with the last topic, which is RF and electrical safety. Cohen, you have any questions, buddy? Um, I know. Well, it makes, makes your head spin, doesn't it? Yeah, believe me. <laughs> well, one of them is I live in, in town, obviously, of course, in Altoona. And the nearest, I guess, airport, if you want to call it that, would be the Altoona Hospital, which is, if I had to guess, uh, from straight shot from me to there, would probably be maybe somewhere under a half mile. Okay. Now, I live up on top of the hill, and, well, let's, I guess to put it this way, Altoona Hospital is directly in front of me um, going across town. Yeah. And I live on the opposite hill. Okay. Um, how would that work with with putting up a with putting up an antenna like that? Um you're I, I think what you're asking me, are you gonna plan to put up a tower? Mm, not work no, I, I'm just curious. Well, I guess the tower and putting up an antenna is two different things. Yeah, uh, exactly. Because unless you're putting up a tower that is going to be significantly higher than, say, the surrounding terrain or the trees or other buildings near you, um, I wouldn't think there's any significant uh, issue or concern there. Um, for the most part, you're probably going to be just fine and uh, like i say if you're going to put up a 200 foot tower uh, since it is in the proximity of the hospital it may require lighting requirements but for the you know you're in town you're probably not going to put up a tower and if you're on a hill your tower doesn't have to be very tall i mean you could put up a 40 uh, 30 40 maybe even a 50 foot tower and still be good because that uh, that med uh, flight as it comes in it's well above anything that you're going to put up, up anyway, um, if you're going to be like 50 feet or below. And watching that thing come in, it, it, it's rather high above the terrain anyway. Yeah, I was, I was just curious whether they would, whether, I have no intentions of putting up a tower, mm -hmm. but I was just kind of curious how that would work with the proximity that, that they are. Probably no concern whatsoever. Okay. Good deal. 
Okay. Answer that question. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, there was one other thing about this standing wave ratio I wanted to ask. Okay. Um, let's see if I can find it here. It was one of the first questions. Yeah, it's not an exact science, unfortunately. Hey, okay, you mentioned different types of cable. Right. Um, okay. Uh, I guess, like, the first question says, what are the typical characteristic impedances of coaxial cables used for antenna feed lines at amateur stations? And the answer the answer for that is uh, 50 to 75 ohms. Um, right. Do they actually make it, uh, cables that's higher than that? And what if would they would there be any benefit to using something better than that? Well, that's your typical uh, impedance. Um, there's all types of feed lines, and they're for different purposes. You have your feed lines for AM broadcast stations and FM broadcast stations and TV broadcast stations. Offhand, I don't know what their impedance characteristics are, um, but they uh, they carry a pretty hefty load going out to the antenna, and most of those feed lines are not flexible at all. Uh, they're usually air core, hard line, and they uh, they are designed to be virtually almost lossless. But uh, there is loss in them, but uh, right. there's such quality. I don't know what their velocity factors are um, or their impedances. But the only thing we need to be concerned about is the 50 ohm. And in, in many, um, you know, for public service, they use a hard line or um, a more rigid feed line. And it's, it's 50 ohm, uh, typically. Um, I have some hard line here. I plan on keeping it. And you, you have several towers set up, or at least eight towers set up, right? I just so have one tower. tower. Yeah, I just have one, one tower. tower. What do you have run to that? Just fifty ohm coaxial. What I have for on my tower, I have a 13 element two meter beam. I have a three band vertical that covers six meters, two meters and 70 centimeters. Now to the two meter beam, I have RG8, a low loss RG8 running to it. Um, for the vertical, I have RG8 running out from the back of the uh, radio to a connector outside. And I have a short run of RG8 because I didn't have a, enough length of hard line. The hard line is connected to directly to the vertical antenna and it runs down the tower to a point where uh, it's near the ground and I have RG8 to that. So my, but my total length from transmitter to the top of the tower is less than 100 feet. The tower itself is is 40 feet, and I might have 20 feet running from there into the shack. So I have about 60 feet of feed line going to both the vertical and the two meter beam. That's pretty impressive. Is there ever a point where there's like, I don't know what to put this. Is there ever a point where there's too much line? I, that would have to be pretty extreme. Obviously, if you're going 200 feet tall of the tower, yeah. yeah I mean, what I'm saying, like, if you have, if you would have your, like, um, I guess one of the examples I wanted earlier when we had done the technician class, you sh had shown us pictures where the the guy had pretty much had a field of antennas yeah and now obviously to get to each one he had to have some some line run pretty far oh yeah yeah is, is there ever a point though where 
distance begins to affect your transmission? Well, in those instances, um, I, I would imagine that if you if your antenna was probably several miles away, yeah, <laughs> but you're, you're not going to really encounter a situation that is where that's going to happen very, very much. If you're going to have an antenna farm, you're going to have some really good coaxial cable. I mean, you you take uh, Tim Duffy K3LRs, for instance, out here in Western PA. Um, he's got an antenna farm that's just unbelievable. And I've got to I've got to say, the guy probably has hundreds of thousands invested in his antenna farm. And you can bet your bottom dollar he's got some really good coax and a lot of uh, a lot of um, coax that doesn't have much loss or feed lines. Let's put it that way. It may not be coax. So I guess also there's a, uh, like a certain like amount of power that you would need also to. To put out to be able to, you know to use that kind of i mean you, you did show us pictures of yeah let me, let me let me put it this way my uh uh for hf and if you remember the chart the amount of loss going down the coax per 100 feet uh for hf frequencies is is not a whole lot and the higher in frequency you go the more loss you're going to have but it's still a good idea to have a good uh, coaxial cable, even if you're running out, you know, a couple hundred feet from the shack um, for HF. And if you go back to that uh, chart on page, where was it? Page 190. You can see there, I, I mean, you go up to, uh, going up to 10 meters even. Uh, you're really looking at less than one dB of loss per hundred feet. So if, if let's say for instance, you're operating 20 meters, which is at 14 megahertz here, it shows in the chart 10, uh, the frequency is 10 megahertz and you have about a half a dB loss. Well, if you're operating 14 megahertz and you have th that kind of feed line going out to your antenna, and you're only going out, say, 100 feet, a half dB loss is very negligible. Uh, for the most part, um, I have feed line that basically is a little better than RG58. It's about the same diameter uh, for all my HF work. And any loss is really, for me, is, is negligible. If I throw 100 watts into it and, and, and I lose and I get say 80 watts to the antenna i'm still fat and happy uh if the if the antenna has let's say a, a one and a half db gain then i'm going to have a that loss is going to be made up in the gain of the antenna okay so that okay i'm starting to see how that works then yeah there's a lot of times, I mean, for years, I used RG58 for pretty much all of my HF work. And I only used RG8 for VHF, UHF. And um, because it's a lot less long, and it's a good quality. You, you, you want to look at the characteristics. You can go online. Let me, let me uh, suggest that you go again and look at the website for ac6v.com. And look at his resources that he has listed there for coaxial cable. You're going to find a chart that's going to show the different types of coaxial cable 50, that are 50 ohm, and it's going to give you pertinent information for each one of those selections, like your velocity factor and your uh, impedance, uh, as well as the amount of loss that is expected along the line for 100 foot of that. Okay, I'll have to take a look at that. Yeah, that's a that's a really good resource, and that's what I would look at too. But there are charts that kind of show all that. At one time, I had a chart here. I mean, 
over the years, things have changed. They come out with better quality stuff. And I, I wouldn't even know where to find my chart now. I just, if, I, if I'm ordering coax, I'll look at the specifications uh, of it and, and see exactly what it is. Uh, just one more question. I heard, I tuned in yesterday and I overheard you talking with another person about the uh, upcoming general license exams. Yeah. And uh, that is the 11th through Saturday. That is what Tom is trying to put together. Now, I thought I thought Eric was going to have a, uh, an exam session uh, for uh, the 4th or the 11th. I couldn't remember exactly when it was, uh, but uh, I was pretty sure. I don't think there was anything on the 4th, but I was pretty sure there was one set for the 11th. And I thought Eric was going to set one up. Um, but there's been a little uh, bantering back and forth between Tom and Eric right now. And uh, let me stop this broadcast here. Be back on uh, Monday with the last topic. <laughs>